All right, so we are looking at uh, Emperor Constantine the Seventh uh, treaty on how to govern the empire, right? And here is an ex excerpt from this. So this is a fixed protocol, diplomatic protocol when uh, diplomats from Bulgaria, which was a Christian neighbor on one hand, on the other hand, for the Byzantines, probably, first of all, it was a hostile barbarian neighbor, despite the fact that the Bulgarians became Christians. But they themselves, from the get-go, wanted to make sure that they would have their own church. They, they received Christianity, they received uh, uh, New Testament teaching, or church teaching, better to say. But at the same time, they, they didn't want to be enslaved, uh, not enslaved, maybe it's too strong to say. They didn't want to be controlled by the Romans through the church. That's, that's how I would like to say it. So, and you read this uh, script, right? So that's what uh, Bulgarians supposed to say. So everything, it's almost like liturgy, right? So all dialogues are there in the service book. So they have to ask, how is the emperor crowned by God, the spiritual godfather of the prince of Bulgaria? So the prince of Bulgaria, uh, leader of Bulgaria is a prince, so definitely of a very, of smaller, smaller weight class, because the only one emperor the, the, the only one emperor was uh, was in Constantinople. Uh, let me just sorry. Uh, right. Uh, so only the only the only emperor was uh, in Constantinople, and uh, so it's kind of polite, polite, uh, polite conversation here. As you see, that uh, then it would follow to uh, to emperors, right? So and then there will be questions regarding the family. So kind of and on and on. Uh, and then there is a question regarding regarding uh, the Bulgarian leader, right? Uh, and how his wife and so on. And so it's quite 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 diplomatic. Okay. Uh, and uh, this gives you idea that basically this uh, on governing the empire gives us a chance to uh, peek into the Byzantine uh, ceremonial life. Okay, how, 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 and to understand that basically their civilization was quite advanced, right, quite advanced. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, so Simeon of Bulgaria, he became the major four of the empire, and he was probably the most successful Bulgarian king. But he, uh, as we talked earlier, he, on one hand, he admired uh, the Byzantine uh, achievements, the Byzantine know-how, the Byzantine culture. On the other hand, he understandably didn't want to uh, subjugate his his uh, Bulgarians to the Romans. So, being a strong man, a strong person, he wanted to take it over and join and join. Uh, the Byzantine Empire to his newly built uh, Bulgarian Empire. So 
uh, it was also mentioned today, uh, I think Ibrahim mentions this, that he was at the walls of Constantinople and no one else but Patriarch Nikolai Mystikos, he, Mystikos means secretary in sense. And he uh, had negotiations similarly as Pope Gregory had negotiations with Attila, right? At the, at the, at the gates, at the wall. So, or reportedly, again, that now they, I think there are questions whether uh, in fact it happened, but nevertheless, so, uh, or how it happened, probably better to say, what was his role of Gregory with the, uh, the Huns. And uh, uh, Simeon. So how then did the patriarch work out the marriage deal? What marriage deal? Uh, between uh, uh, the marriage deal that uh, Simeon worked out where his daughter was to be married to Constantine the seventh. Right, right. I mean, what, what happened uh, in 914, right, 914 uh, mm -hmm. or 914, right, that uh, Patriarch Nicholas Mystic, uh, uh, Mysticos, he uh, crowned, crowned uh, emperor, uh, I mean, he crowned uh, Simeon as an emperor, but mm -hmm. somehow uh, keeping his fingers crossed at his bed because Simeon uh, left from the walls with the title of an emperor, but there was like an asterisk and a footnote that basically emperor of Bulgarians. So what Simeon understood and what exactly how it was done, that's another thing, but uh, because of uh, patriarchal involvement, kind of they played as a team this time, right? Uh, that patriarch and the emperor, they uh, made common front uh, against against uh, outsiders, against Bulgarians. So Ocho, what I'm asking- I know, I know, I know, I know. We'll get there, we'll get there. I, I, I perfectly understood your question regarding the marriage, yes. So, uh, okay. And uh, Simeon was uh, crowded and now he uh, started to uh, feel himself as he was in fact, uh, for this, uh, a point for this job to be new uh, emperor uniting both Romans and Bulgarians. Okay, so uh, Zoe was sent to the convent, right? And uh, uh, Roman became a uh, new emperor. But uh, he uh didn't really care very much about about his business he it wasn't something that he was really interested he was more interested in private life and whenever things like that uh, happen right uh, somebody else would feel uh, the vacuum and in this case it was unique joseph bringus who was uh, a last uh, a last uh, uh, Eschion, a last uh, son of the Amorian uh, dynasty because he was a son of Michael the Sword. Okay, so in this circumstances, Nik Nikiforos Phocas uh, succeeded in becoming an emperor. Okay, and he was uh, a general from very influential Focus family, and he became a regent for emperors Basil and Constantine. And this was Basil who became Basil II, right? And he uh, married their mother, Empress Feofana. So, but, but they didn't have uh, any, any spousal relations, right? So they, can't, they lived they live with brother and uh, brother and sister. 
So regaining of regaining of uh, former Byzantine territories continued. Okay, to the point that Cyprus, that used to be under dual uh, governorship by the Arabs and Romans, came back to the empire. Another event to celebrate that Antioch, which is modern, uh, in modern time, I mean, which is nowadays on the Syrian Turkish border, right? Came back, came back to the empire. And that's something that it hasn't, it, 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 it had been out of the Roman uh, control for, for centuries. Okay. But now also that was interesting that Nikiforos focus he came up with something that often is often uh, invoked as a until nowadays. He wanted to uh, reinforce Roman feeling of patriotism and uh, dedication and, and commitment to the cause. And uh, he thought that those. Uh, uh, soldiers who fell, who fell uh, at the at the battlefield fighting against Muslims, they should be treated uh, as saints, right? But it was declined, and we mentioned tetragamy, and there w w also was case regarding uh, John Simis He, who wanted to. All right, so, well, we'll talk, we'll get there, but there was also Patriarch Polyaxos in this, in this time who stood up uh, for church canons, so uh, church, church traditions. Uh, a point here that church was free enough to voice uh, her concerns and speak against an emperor in Byzantium generally. The highest point of control was under the, the iconoclast emperors. So outside of this, uh, depends on personality of a patriarch, but there were many instances when patriarchs, they disagree and refuse in blessing uh, to, uh, to an emperor, right? So, so now, Romans II, Constantine the seventh son, okay, so uh, he was for the first time married to Feofana. Uh, and then uh, Feofana married for the second time, uh, Nikiforos Phocas, who was a regent for Basil II and Constantine VIII. Okay, so uh, if Romanus Lycopenus contributed toward uh, rights of peasants and defending peasants and uh, sort of uh, coming up with a sensible reform regarding taxation. A new military units started to be employed. And I'm sure you, you guys heard of them, know of them, uh, read about them. And those are cataphractes, which uh, heavily, heavily mount, mounted, heavily uh, armed, uh, armored uh, horsemen. Okay. So Fiafana, she had a, she 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 had a sweetheart, right? She, uh, who uh, and and this was uh, John Simiski, another military person. And uh, John Simiski, he succeeded in uh, plotting against Nikiforos and took over, took over, took over from Nikiforos uh, and became an emperor. And John Simis, he, he was a very successful emperor. That's why he's in the ball. Uh, Unfortunately for Fiafana, he didn't keep his part of the deal and she was pushed aside and she, she became a nun. 
because uh, patriarch Polyactos, he was uh, furious about killing of Nisiphorus and the whole idea that basically Nisiphorus wife plotted against her husband with a sweetheart and then both of them would be would be uh, would reign the empire it was too much even for him right so by all Byzantine standards so and so therefore uh, calculating his cost benefits uh, 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 John Semisky decided that he would do better off without Fiafana, but he would uh, gain from the support of the church. So that's also very Byzantine, uh, Byzantine dilemma, Byzantine uh, questions. And instead, uh, he married uh, a daughter of Constantine the Seventh. So, and now, can you believe this? There are more victories and there are more territories Aleppo regained from the Arabs. Uh, and also Byzantium uh, come uh, come, uh, comes uh, across a strong with flying colors. And it's just 100 years before the Frost Crusade. It's also to keep track what's going on. It's 100 years roughly before the Frost Crusade and 100 years before going uh, this, down the slopery hill. Okay, so kind of we are looking right now. I uh, still the 11th century was quite was until I think as I think actually we are entering this in the last hundred peaceful years of the Byzantine history, starting at the end of the 10th century and lasting until Alexius uh, Komnenos. Okay. Um, uh, so that's also good to to mark good to good to uh, uh, understand okay so uh, we are now also having strong records about uh, uh, about the Russians uh, in Ra in either 957 or I, I, I don't remember what the other uh, uh, proposed date, maybe 947, I don't remember, but I think 957, that's, uh, that I'm, I'm positive. That's one of the uh, strongly believed uh, date when uh, Princess Olga baptized in Constantinople. So she baptized uh, in Constantinople uh, when there was Patriarch Polyevkus, right? Uh, and she came back to Rus, to Russia. Uh, what is Russia again? When I say Russia, it's very conventional because Russia, strictly speaking, Russia, if you use it, it's, it starts with Peter the Great. It's it's that's 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 Russia. Everything else has different names before, but uh, the whole war, the word Rus, right? The word Rus is. Uh, connected with uh, probably Scandinavian, uh, Scandin of Scandinavian origin, and is connected with Scandinavians. So that what uh, the Byzantines meant, basically like Normans coming, that would be Rus for them. Okay, so there are attempts to, uh, uh, of Russians to, to push away Bulgarians and settled in modern day Bulgaria. So, and that's something that Byzantines were in position to, to deal with. So they chased, uh, chased away Russians and also at the same time, they uh, took over the Eastern part of Bulgaria, right? Which was a very big success for them because they kind of went uh, on the uh, mission to destroy Bulgaria, right? They didn't want a Bulgaria to be a competitor. They didn't want to put up with any nonsense like Bulgarians, they call themselves, they would call themselves equal with Romans. So or Bulgarians would uh, actually call the shots and call themselves uh, emperor of Romans and Bulgarians. So you, I mean, you crazy, what, what kind of 
you know, what is comparison between the two? Okay, so uh, continue, uh, uh, Byzantine uh, territorial territorial uh, expansions continued. A good question wa was the same as uh, Justinian, uh, whether whether uh, whether uh, the, the empire was in position to to uh, maintain maintain all those uh, all those uh, uh, territories to to keep them. Okay, another interesting thing also connected with, with this period. Uh, and I also, I kind of be, I believe that you, you read about this as well. Uh, this is uh, a phenomenon of making money in Constantinople. And people would go to make a buck in Constantinople from as far as England. And this is new thing of the Varangian guards. Uh, uh, so, and uh, let's see, actually, all right now, I think that's a good uh, time to see what I have here regarding this. Okay. All right. Took takes a while to open a presentation. This is a presentation of uh, a former student in Byzantine history, David Borg. Uh, I, I, I think you, you met him. You met David. He uh, is uh, in Michigan right now. I think he got married not long ago. So he himself from Sweden, so it kind of was sensible to come up with uh, this presentation for him. Okay. So now, uh, and uh, speaking of uh, Varangian guards, uh, I would like to mention that they they were mercenaries, but mercenaries who. Uh, had a very strong honor code. Like for instance, there was a case when one of the Varangian guards somewhere attempted to rape a woman. And this woman succeeded in taking a knife and getting and gut, gutting this man, getting, getting guts out of him. And Varangians came to this woman and they gave her all possessions of this man. So they were, they were very, how to say, they were very, uh, strict about following their court. Okay. So I don't know why I cannot open this one. Okay, are bringing yeah. variaki. Right. Yes, that's in Russian. In Russian, they are uh, they are, they are, they are, they are variagi. That's why uh, that's why uh, the trade route from Novgorod to the Black Sea, and then from the Black Sea to Constantinople was called uh, is variagov Greki. Okay. Right. If cannot would be better. Okay, so while I'm working on this, right? Uh, so let's see what's going on here also in chat. Yeah, that's Ivan. I think you're right. That he was 16 years old, not 19 years old. I think that's that's a good catch. Was it wasn't a, a bad patriarch? It's just what the textbook said. Right, right, right. No, that's that, that, that's good. Good catch. Uh, Sarmatians brought 
captor fracts. Okay, yeah. And actually, I just show you one quick thing right now regarding captor fracts that is, I think, useful. Okay. So um, I'm not sure if I uh, trying to build if if I share muscle. if I Just share stop because for if guys I of share, a certain age can you can you hear well to assassinate can you hear well the many okay. centuries before the night dominated the battlefields of medieval Europe far to the east their predecessor the cataphract a heavily armored mounted warrior inspired awe and terror in their opponents. Cataphract is a transliteration of a Greek term meaning covered with armor, which accurately describes this class of horse and rider. The earliest known heavily armored human and horse collaborations were utilized by the empires of the late ancient Near Eastern Bronze Age. Chariots drawn by horses covered in barding, which is horse armor, carried bronze clad warriors a truly expensive and potent symbol of imperial might. Much later, the Assyrian Empire was the first state to use large numbers of cavalry on the battlefield, beginning in the 9th century BC. Gradually, all major states replaced chariots with cavalry in their armies. On the periphery of the Iranian plateau, in what is now Turkmenistan and Afghanistan, semi-nomadic Iranian-speaking peoples began using significant amounts of armor on larger breeds of horses. The Persian Achaemenid Empire incorporated these heavy cavalry troops in their armies. These were the earliest iterations of cataphracts used. After the empire's conquest by Alexander, the succeeding Seleucid and Parthian empires further developed the tactics, arms, and armor of the cataphract. During the Parthian Empire, the cataphract developed into a more heavily armored horseman than ever before, being almost completely covered in metal. They carried the Kantos, a cavalry pike which was an adapted version of the Greek Zeiston used by the Seleucids. The Romans first came into contact with the cataphracts through conflict with these empires, as well as with the Iranian-speaking Sarmatians, who had migrated to the north of the Roman Empire. The Romans were slow to integrate their use. Captured enemies and small units of foreign auxiliary troops were the first cataphracts used in Roman armies, notably the Sarmatians and Armenians. The true age of the cataphract occurred during the 3rd through 7th centuries AD, after the Sassanid Persians overthrew the Parthians. High-quality cataphracts were used in greater numbers, not only by the Sasanians, but also by the Romans. Sassanid strategy and tactics were intrinsically different from the Parthians. While the Parthians preferred to fight a defensive war of attrition against the Romans within their own familiar territory, the Persians were far more aggressive choosing to invade and fight on Roman territory. On the battlefield, the Parthians heavily relied on the hit and run tactics of their skilled mounted archers. Only when an enemy was exhausted, wounded, and frustrated would the cataphracts comprised of the Parthian nobility be sent in to break and mop up the enemy infantry. Cataphracts would also be used to protect their own horse archers from light enemy cavalry counterattacks, while a typical Parthian army included a little more than a thousand cataphracts. In contrast, a standard Sassanid army on campaign would field over 10 times that number. The Savaran cataphracts formed the vanguard of the Sasanian battle order and would directly engage Roman heavy infantry, which were still arguably the best in the world, while supported by horse archers to their rear. If the opposing army did not break after the initial charge, the Savaran would withdraw to the rear while being covered by volleys from the horse archers. Alternatively, a similar strategy was also employed where infantry followed the cataphract's initial assault. In reaction to Sassanid Persian success on the battlefield, the Romans did what they did best. They adapted. Over the three centuries of strife between the two great empires, the Romans recruited an ever-increasing number of cataphracts, not only from enemy captives, allies, and vassals, but from imperial citizens, particularly from provinces with strong horse-riding traditions such as Macedonia, Thessaly, Thrace, Syria, and Lesser Armenia. Over time, cataphracts transitioned from specialized foreign auxiliary troops of minor importance to the most prestigious and renowned units in the empire. They adopted many Iranian arms, armor, and cavalry techniques. Throughout their history, 
The Sassanid Persians also greatly increased the number of cataphracts in their army. They were able to equip, maintain, and train more because they were significantly wealthier and more populous compared to the earlier Parthian Empire, which only equipped the most venerable nobility as cataphracts. The Sasanian elite heavy cavalry were known as the Savaran. At the top, the seven great houses of the Sassanid Empire, called the Wuzargan, supplied the most formidable cavalry, for which no expense was spared. These extended families were very large, with thousands of members and hundreds of military-age males, many of whom fought with retinues of additional cataphracts equipped by the family. The House of Sasan was the first of these great houses, led by the Shah and Shah, meaning King of Kings. The six other great houses were of complete or partial Parthian ancestry, and were engaged in a near constant power struggle with the Shah and Shah. More numerous in the Savaran were the Azadan, a large class of higher nobility. They trace back their ancestry to those that fought alongside Cyrus the Great and established the First Persian Empire over a thousand years before the fall of the Sassanids. In the later portion of Sassanid history, the Deccan class of lower landed semi-nobility also joined the ranks of the Savaran, greatly increasing their numbers. Additionally, vassal kings such as the Kushan Shahs and the Armenian king. Well, so we're looking at the Anglo-Saxon video you have pulled up. You do. Okay, okay, okay. sorry. Of cataphracts. Uh, Both Parthian and later Sassanid cataphracts used the contos to great okay. effect. On initial impact with infantry, Roman writers recounted how two men could be impaled at once. Now, at now I'm lost, but in addition to a could, long yeah. slashing sword, which was always carried okay. as a sidearm, a wide variety of maces and axes right, right, right. were also used in close combat. Maces were the what, preferred Persian what, weapon. Do you see it now? Did it come back? Yes, we we oh. see it, but I think you need to connect the computer audio because it's playing the audio that your microphone is picking up from your voice in the speakers. We okay. can still hear it. It's just like right. Oh, yeah. Fine, fine, fine. Now I have to find this. I have to find the right one. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, let's do a new share now. Yeah. And that should work right now. Yeah. Okay. When locked in combat with heavy infantry or with other cataphracts. Often, cataphract armor was of such high quality that a slash from a sword or a thrust from a lance would cause little to no significant damage or glance right off. In contrast, the percussion of a mace strike could break the bones of a horseman wearing the latest and greatest armor. Or if struck on the head, he could be rendered unconscious or incapacitated. The Savaran also practiced a regimented weight training and martial arts still practiced today and recognized by UNESCO as the world's longest running form of strength training. This greatly aided the Savaran in their cranium crushing activities where heroic titles could be granted, such as having the strength of a thousand men. Mid to later Sassanid Savaran also carried a bow so that if the situation presented itself, enemy infantry could be softened up before the charge. There are also accounts that the Savaran carried a weapon which was five shot and single use, and may have been a peculiar type of crossbow. After more than three centuries of war with the Romans, in which both empires expended massive amounts of human and material resources, the Sassanid dynasty fell to the first Arab empire. Savaran cataphract, arms, tactics, and culture did not die with them. These had already been adopted by the Turks and the Arabs soon after, as the Romans had done earlier. Through interaction with Rome, the Germanic kingdoms that arose in the ashes of the Western Roman Empire adopted elements of cataphract weapons, tactics, and culture. These were modified and improved over the centuries and evolved into the iconic knights from the Normans through the Crusades and Renaissance. The Savaran cataphract's personal heraldry and jousting for honor and to settle conflicts would have been aspects of their culture that would have seemed very familiar to medieval knights. Despite the similarities, there were several notable differences between the two. The Roman cataphract survived and continued to evolve, and would have been quite similar to the earliest medieval knights of Western Europe, which later surpassed them in the development of their military technology. Okay, okay. so what is what is important here, right? Uh, that uh, when we will be mentioning, right, uh, the battle of the Sea of Galilee in 100 years later. That was actually one of the reasons why Crusaders 
lost to uh, Saladin's troops because their very expensive, very expensive uh, heavenly mounted horsemen were not up to uh, uh, fight in very uh, hard uh, uh, conditions of Palestine, right? So kind of gives a, gives idea also that cataphracts, they are very expensive. It's very, they, they are very, uh, they, they requires several people to look after this horseman and then they are not universal. So kind of Arabs with their light cavalry, they were uh, better equipped to operate in uh, Byzantine and the Palestine uh, environment than uh, cataphracts who would only kind of work when uh, everything else is arranged on the battlefield. So now I could not uh, use uh, David Borg thing, but uh, I, and it's pity because he, he did it for our class. But I would like to use instead uh, another uh, in, uh, video that uh, I'm, I am familiar with as well. Okay, let's see. All right. Okay. Stop share. Okay, yep, yeah, that's it should work now. Ashley. <laughs> To a schoolman to go to the God I don't want. We hear a video call.
Bands. Guess what? Yeah, that's it, yeah. that it's 100 years later but gives you gives you idea about Varangian guards right let me get back to okay so that's that's on the track right uh, new new share okay. Right, so take a look at this breakdown, Byzantium and Bulgaria, and you see expanding Bulgarian empire 
and Byzantine Empire. Okay. And how it was progressing. So Ivan mentioned to us about increase in trade taxes imposed on Bulgarians, invasion by Tsar Simeon. So, and Byzantines, even as part of their larger grand strategy, didn't have a problem to pay off. It would be sort of, it's like modern day shrewd calculations. So what, what is cost benefit analysis? Choose your battles kind of, they would be better off paying to Bulgarians instead of, uh, instead of uh, losing, losing their soldiers, losing their servicemen fighting against them. Okay. Uh, we talked about like for marriages. So, and look at this picture, right? And I don't think you need introduction. So you know who is this, right? Is that Simeon, the it first is. of Bulgaria? It is, it is. That's very ironic because I mean, <laughs> This is a Byzantine uh, Vasilevsis, right? Why won't you just let him be in charge and maybe then that would spare the empire, who knows, right? But things, things don't work this, this way. It's sort of from our, from Jordan Williams in 21st century, that might look this way. It would be much more sensible let uh, Simeon to take over, but- He's yeah. got a good beard, he can roll. I see that that that's what that what actually that, that's how things are defined. Okay, so that is it. Uh, right now, uh, we had uh, any any questions besides? I know that there was question from you graph. We, you need you need send it to me. Okay, you graph what 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 we regarding succession. Uh, you need to send, send it uh, via chat or whatever. Because uh, and any other questions from you? Okay, so uh, Artyom, I need to hear from you regarding your paper, what you finally uh, have decided to write on, okay? So, and uh, uh, Paul, anything from, from your end? No? Okay. So then I will ask I will ask Paul to 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 read it is truly meat okay so it is truly me to bless thee the Theotokos ever blessed and most blameless and mother of our God more honorable than the cherubim and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim who without corruption gave us birth to God the word, the very Theotokos we do we magnify. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Father. Okay, I will, I will take care of other questions regarding readings right now and the midterm and so on, what we talked uh, about. Okay.